my view, the gold standard as an advocate for any homeless or uh, person who needs a social care in Ireland. So give it a round of applause for them.
five or years when we have more money than we knew what to do with. And the number of social housing units being built drops dramatically. Successive government, <coughs> for ideological reasons, even more than for financial reasons, pushed the problem of social housing onto the private sector to a huge increase in the number of low-income households uh, being forced to seek housing in the private rental sector and through Section 5 of the Planning and Development Act, which required developers to hand over to the local authorities 20% of all residential output so that the local authorities could use that for social and affordable housing. <coughs> This the reliance on the private rent and on the private sector simply fails, as we can see today, catastrophically. Under pressure from the development lobby, that 20% of output that was to be used for social housing was watered down. So that during the Celtic <coughs> year, only 3.7% of all residential output was actually handed over for social housing. The private rental sector, a demand far exceeds supply, leading to an increase in rents, making them unaffordable. We had a guy, he was <coughs> renting at around 950 euros a month. The landlord came along and said, next month the rent is going up to 1,300 euros. Now, he was on a rent supplement. He had absolutely no way of paying the, the, uh, <coughs> the excess, and he ended up in homeless hospitals. <coughs> this increase in rents obviously is predominantly affecting people on low incomes and those dependent on the rent supplement and the landlords, some of them, are using the increase in rents to drive out those on rent supplement because they prefer people who are paying. In such a <coughs> So we have a huge crisis. The majority of people and families becoming homeless today are coming from the private rental sector because of the increase in rents. And the outlook for the future is catastrophic. In December of last year, there were about 54,000 mortgages in arrears of more than two years. 37,700 of those were private residential homes, and 15,400 were buy to -less. Most of those 54,000 mortgages in arrears for more than two years are unsustainable. There is no solution. And the banks themselves <coughs> estimate that about 25,000 of those are going to be repossessed over the next few years. Every house repossessed, whether it's a buy to let or somebody's primary home, every house repossessed is potentially a household plunged into homelessness. <coughs> so the problem of homelessness has changed in four ways over the last couple of years. First is the number. In March of last year, 2,300 adults sought emergency accommodation in the Dublin region. In August of this year, 18 months later, 17 months later, that number had risen by over 1,000 to 3,372. In Dublin, the official figures are that there are five people becoming newly homeless every day. So the numbers of homeless people are going through the roof, and that is reflected in the number of people who are sleeping properly. Secondly, and even more worryingly, is the number of families becoming homeless. In 2012, there were seven or eight families becoming homeless every month. In 2013, there were, on average, 20 families a month becoming homeless. In 2014, there were, on average, 40 families a month becoming homeless. In the first six months of this year, there were 60 families a month becoming homeless. In July, there were 70 families becoming homeless. In August, 
78 families became homeless, and we don't have the figures yet for September. <coughs> Most families who become homeless are provided with emergency accommodation in hotel bedrooms. Can you imagine? One family I know, two parents, an 18-year-old boy, a 16-year-old boy, and three younger children, all living in one bedroom. They have no cooking facilities, so you have to go out to the takeaways for your food for your family. They have no access to laundry facilities, so you have to pay the laundry to wash the clothes, and your children may be two bus rides away from the school, which means you have to spend a fortune on bus fares, which you can't afford. The move into emergency accommodation may have significant impact on children's education. They have no quiet place to study, and in some instances have to make long and expensive journeys through their school. If there's a football <coughs> match or other event on uh, that weekend, the family will be told by the hotel that the room is pre-booked and they will have to leave. And they have to find their own accommodation then for the weekend. Families are already being told that uh, their hotel bedroom has been booked for the Christmas season. And so uh, many, many of those families' and hotel bedrooms will become homeless over the Christmas season. And there is no way for them to go. Focus Ireland has rightly called the situation of children living in emergency accommodation a child welfare crisis. Some families have been in hotel bedrooms for two years and they still see no sign of moving on. One family was given a hotel bedroom in June of this year and in September, June, July, August, four months later, they were on their 20th hotel bedroom. They had been moved. <coughs> but the ones in hotel bedrooms are the lucky ones. Emergency for accommodation for families now, certainly in the Dublin area, is non-existent. Whole families are being told there's no accommodation available. I had a telephone call late at night from parents I know asking could they sleep in my car with their child because there was no accommodation available. Others have gone out to the airport to spend the night there. Parents are putting their children into care or into the care of grandparents and extended family, so as to avoid having them to sleep on the street with the parents. Families are splitting up, father taking one or two children and going to live with his parents, the mother taking the other children and going to live with her parents. <coughs> one mother rang me late on a Friday night to say that she and her young child had been told there was no accommodation available for them. She was in great distress at the saw of sleeping on the street with her child for the weekend. Good question there, Claire, it's most clear for. Um, apparently, in the that the, the, um, the Taoiseach was on the street for the morning, and he spent the night and was taken back, saw what was actually what was happening on the ground. Why do you think he hasn't acted on it? Of course, he can certainly have it for you consulted by any department with budget mind. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I, uh, I'm very supportive of Alan Kelly. He's the one who's taking all the blame for this. But he's not the person. He is totally frustrated. He is frustrated by Andrew Kenny, by Michael Nuno and that uh, introduced red caps. He's frustrated that Joe Burton won't raise the uh, red supplement. He's frustrated by the local authorities who aren't playing ball well sometimes. He is very frustrated. And, uh, so uh, the image I use is he's trying to empty the water out of the bath, but Joan Burton has the taps on the food. So I have great sympathy for Adam Kelly, and I think he is one of the few in this government who really do have an understanding and a concern for the problem of homelessness. Uh, but he's the one who's likely to pay the price, because he's the minister with direct responsibility. What's happening is that Enda Kenny, through the Minister for Finance, is saying, look, we have a huge problem of homelessness. 
Here, the Minister of Finance is going to give the Department of the Environment all the money they want. The Department of the Environment is saying that there's a problem with homelessness. It's the local authorities. So, so we give the local authorities all the money they want. That's not where the solution lies. The solution lies in, in policy. Rent caps, increasing rent, supplement. The solution lies not just in throwing money at homelessness, but in the policies that will prevent more and more people coming into homelessness. There are two problems. One is getting those people who are currently homeless out of homelessness, and that requires money. But, as I say, unless you prevent more and more people and families coming into homelessness, then you're going, to, you're going to be throwing money at this forever and ever and ever. And preventing more people coming into homelessness is not a question of money, it's a question of public policy. And there is no recognition, it seems to me, in the government except for Alan Kelly, that public policy, that policies, uh, policy decisions have to be taken. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, not getting that message to Kenny Kenny is a uh, member of Fianna Gael, Fianna Gael or a centre-right government, or as I would call it, a right-right wing government. So they don't want to interfere with the market, uh, therefore they don't want to interfere with the controls. They are, the, they are relying, just as being appointed during the Celtic Tiger years, they are relying on the private sector to solve the problem of homelessness. In the social housing strategy, which Alan Kelly announced in uh, November, 100 he was, he was reckoning then on 110,000 households in the, uh, on the waiting list. How are they going to eliminate the housing waiting list? 35,000 social housing units were to be provided, and 75,000 households were to be placed in the private rental sector. Two problems with that. The reliance on the private rental sector has failed. We have all the evidence we need that it has failed, and continuing to rely on the private rental sector will continue to fail. And uh, the, uh, the second problem is that the private rental sector at the moment is part of the problem, not part of the solution. How do you wave a magic wand and make a call of the, uh, of the solution? The only solution to homelessness and to the housing problem is social in the long term, social housing, that is housing that is controlled by the local authority. Let's leave the private rental, let's leave the private sector to build motorways or, uh, or whatever, but the private sector cannot provide social needs. And that's what we're doing all the time. Childcare. Childcare is provided in this country by the private sector. With grants from the government, of course, but it's provided by the private sector. In many other countries, childcare is provided by the state. Most of the elderly who have to go into care are, is provided by the private sector. With this reliance on the private sector to meet social needs has failed and will continue to fail. And unless we invest in social housing, the problem of homelessness is never going to be. And the problem of the social housing waiting list is never going to happen. But would you say that like the main problem with the housing policy in making people homeless is that they're relying too much on the private sector? Is that what it is? That yeah. is the reason we have gotten to this situation. And I think there is still a huge dependence on the private sector to get us out of this situation. And that won't work. What would it cost to provide social housing for the 100 and 110,000 households on the social housing waiting list? It would cost about 1 billion euros a year for the next 20 years. Is that achievable? It has to be achievable. We have 2.5 billion euros already this year in tax revenues that we didn't anticipate. It has to be achievable because housing is one of the most fundamental human rights. There are five fundamental human rights. The right to adequate food, the right to education, the right to health, the right to work, and the right to a home. They are the five fundamental rights because without one of those, 
You cannot live a proper, dignified human life. But the right to a home is the most basic. Because if you don't have a home, if you don't have proper housing, your ability to access education, or training, or employment, is extraordinarily limited. How can you do that if you're living on the streets? Your health is going to deteriorate. You're not going to have enough to eat. And you're certainly not going to eat nutritionally. So having a home is the most basic of the five fundamental rights, and therefore it is incumbent on any government which seeks to meet the common good to ensure that housing for all its citizens is a top priority. And unfortunately, uh, that is not the situation in this country. So do you not think, Peter, that there should be a constitutional right to housing? I think that there should be a constitutional right to housing. The problem of homeless young people under, the 18, under 18 has changed enormously over the past uh, 15 or so years. Uh, when I started, the health boards as it was then were, had not the slightest interest in homeless children. We opened our first hostel, we went to the health boards for money, they said we don't agree with this hostel, we don't see the need for this hostel, we're not going to give you money. Uh, they didn't want to know. Now services for homeless under 18 are infinitely better. Not perfect, but infinitely better than they were then. And what made the difference? The difference was the Child Care Act of 1991, which gave homeless children a right to suitable accommodation. Mm -hmm. And homeless children who weren't getting it went to the High Court. Hundreds of children went to the High Court to demand a right to suitable accommodation. And the government were forced to spend money and provide services that they didn't want to do. But they were forced. At one stage, the uh, minister involved, George, uh, the judge involved, George Peter Kelly, who was leading in all these cases, threatened to jail three government ministers for failing to provide children with their legal rights. If we had the right to housing in our constitution or in our legislation, it would change everything. But they're not going to do that. They've learned their lesson from the child care. They are not going to give anybody else social reproductive rights. But it would solve everything. Now, we're not going to get that into the constitution. But one way forward, uh, I would like to see, in Switzerland, if you get enough signatures, you can demand a referendum. I think the vast majority of people in this country would support the right to housing being in the Constitution. And if we could get that uh, law passed, that if you could gather maybe a million signatures, you had to have a referendum on, on a particular issue, then I think we could uh, uh, we would easily get a million signatures to support the right to housing, a constitutional, a referendum on the right to housing in the Constitution. So I'd love to see us pushing that door open that uh, if we could get a million signatures on any issue, the government would be obliged to hold a referendum on that particular issue. That's a door that over time, I think, might open and could lead the way to a right to housing. You, you, you said Congress early on, and I think the freedom said, said that it's not a case of just being gay yeah, don't know about it or labor don't know about it, but they know it. And it was an ideological decision in it. Said, you know, I mean, if you look for giveaway budgets, uh, the election vote by and budget, what they had in it, uh, they had a cut to, down to 6% for corporation taxes to concern research and development, so more money from multinational. You have no wealth tax, no increase in high rate of tax, you have cuts in, in tax rating for people earning above 70,000, but also you have 17 million in homeless emergency services, which isn't enough. But then you have 50 million spent on the 1916 rising commemoration, you know, two and a half times the amount. Like, I can't speak for the days, but uh, I'm sure if you resurrected someone like James Conley and asked him where the money should go, you know. But just one question on, on the modular homes. Um, I've seen them, I don't know that about them, but do you think it might be another example of a kind of right-wing government using a cheap solution to a long-term problem? kind of like the Ballymont Flats, or like direct division that in the short term they're nice, but over time, you know, they come to prep with non vested and end up coming yeah. long term. Yeah, I'm not in favor of modular units, except that we have a crisis, and we need to, take, to do everything possible to help us get over this crisis, and therefore I'm in favor of modular units. But I would like a policy decision made that uh, when social housing becomes available, 
that it would be families in the modular units who get priority for the social housing, and then other families move into the modular units, wait their turn, and move on. Policy decision like that would eliminate the possibility of these becoming permanent solutions for the And there was 68 million allocated for how extra, an extra 68 million allocated for housing in the budget. 47 million of that is going to the house scheme mm. to pay private landlords <coughs> to take in people on that supplements. And that indicates to me the, uh, the ideological priorities of what is going on. Any final questions before we wrap it up? Okay, we have one more round of applause. Ha, 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 ha.